If you can, imagine yourself here in 4,000 square kilometers of protected wilderness where all you have is a canoe, camping gear, and yourself. In 2014, we took a trip to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, which borders the United States and Canada. The purpose of our trip was to immerse ourselves into the wilderness. Now picture big lakes connected to each other through small hiking passages. Nothing but the sounds of canoe paddles dipping into the clear lake water and loons singing to one another in the distance, all while admiring thousands of trees surrounding each lake, finding hidden waterfalls on small islands, and looking for constellations among the beautiful stars dotting the panoramic sky at night. This remarkable experience wasn't without its challenges. Our primary source of food were light snacks and the fish that we planned to catch. Our understanding of time was only dependent on the sun. One afternoon, after setting up camp, we went out onto the water to hopefully catch our fish for dinner. However, our understanding of time was not very... Uh, we couldn't figure it out through the, 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 through the, the sun. And also, our understanding of and uh, practice of fishing was not very good. However, shortly before sunset, we caught our fish that we qualified as a light snack. We decided to head on back to camp. However, we lost our camp due to the impending darkness. We paddled back and forth for over two hours, wondering if we we're actually going to be sleeping in the canoe that night. Fortunately for us, we found our campsite uh, at, shortly after the sunset and uh, made it back just in time for our light snack. The next day, as we were treading through knee-deep mud while carrying our canoes overhead from one lake to another, we began to wonder why we brought so many essentials. With persistence, we did make it through, despite major physical exhaustion. Then on the final day, an intense storm broke out, and we paddled for at least an hour in the heavy rain before we reached our final destination, soaked from head to toe. Now, what do we remember from this trip? It wasn't particularly these challenges that we faced being in the wilderness. Rather, it was this restoration we felt being immersed into nature. My memories were focused on the mental clarity and stress relief I felt from taking a break from challenging work demands at the time. And I was reminded how we, as people, have designed ourselves out of nature and do not collectively prioritize it in with our urban development. And so you actually may be wondering, while you're sitting here right now, why we are up here giving this talk. And it's actually not about our wilderness experience to that scale. We actually represent two very different fields, medicine and landscape architecture. And we would actually like to tell you about our sturdy journey of collaboration, about how we are inspired to connect others to nature, but also inspire others to work together using nature as an important part of the palette that we use to improve society. As a pediatrician, I focus on helping families improve their physical and mental health. And I've noticed that many of the kids that I work with seem stressed earlier in life with higher workloads in school and are overscheduled with extracurricular activities. Parents are stressed as well. It seems like getting into a preferred kindergarten is starting to look like a college admissions process. Unfortunately, global trends are starting to show that free time and play for children is becoming a luxury. With the background in landscape architecture, I use nature as a primary part of the design toolkit that holds the same level of priority as other items that define our cities, such as buildings and municipal infrastructure. When we don't value our environment, the health of our cities, as well as our ecology, become compromised. Soil, air, and water pollution all occur, all impacting public health. However, if we value nature and consider it an important part of our design toolkit that, that helps build our cities, the health of our cities, as well as the people in our cities, can be improved. So we are currently working together to promote this human connection to nature through research and educational programs. And we feel that fields outside of ours can also come together and be inspired to advocate change. So we propose a call to action, which we hope can influence policy at a multitude of scales. To get there, we as individuals can work together and prioritize nature and consider an important part that we, of the palette that we use to advance the society. And why should we care? In our modern society, the human connection with nature has become less of a priority due to many competing demands. The problem is, it's making us sicker. Indoor air quality is often worse than outdoors, which leads to increased rates of asthma and allergies. Global rates of obesity have tripled in the last 44 years. 
And also, this time inside is leading to excessive screen time, which is associated with depression, anxiety, lower rates of self-esteem. It's becoming such a problem that internet and gaming addictions have recently been classified as actual medical diagnoses. And we have been designing ourselves out of nature, particularly in urban areas where over half the world's population resides. In developed regions, approximately 90% of our time is spent indoors. This is due to the increased time we spend at home, as well as office workers spending 40 to 60 hours a week in the workplace. So what can we do? Let's start broadly at the policy level. As an example, in the United States, there was a bill passed in 2001 called No Child Left Behind. And this was meant to improve standardized test scores across all students. But an unintended consequence was to reduce recess time in favor of more classroom instruction. This has since been removed from educational policy. And now, through advocacy efforts, there have been no child left inside programs implemented instead. There's currently a bill being reviewed in our home state of Minnesota to hopefully offer more funding for schools to have outdoor field trips. And these grassroots movements are happening all over America. One of our collaborations involves using geographic information to compare landscape features surrounding schools with student-reported anxiety, mood, and problem behaviors in fifth graders in the United States. Our findings have shown that students attending schools with higher levels of paved surfaces have increased odds at engaging in problem behaviors in students attending schools with less of these features. Findings such as these, we hope, can influence policy, but also school planning initiatives, design decisions, for the purpose of improving that, uh, the behavior of the students. Now, at the community level, we know that students are spending less time outdoors which may be leading to attention and focus issues throughout the school day. So we've been working together to create an interactive curriculum using green walls in schools. With this curriculum, students engage in planting and design using principles of science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. They collaboratively build these living walls for their schools or classrooms. They complete them from start to finish, and once they are finished, the students continue to engage with these living walls through ongoing plant care throughout the school year. Fortunately, these kids don't just see it as another task. They have sent me thank you cards telling me how much fun they've had. When kids understand the importance of the human to nature connection, they are more likely to incorporate it into their future career paths and value and cherish such places as the Boundary Waters. This program isn't just for kids. We also work with college level students and people in business. By bringing nature and plants indoors, improved attention increases the effectiveness for someone to learn, as well as work productivity. Now, to spark individual change, doctors are beginning to prescribe nature instead of focusing on medications alone. We started a program at our clinic to help families set goals to increase their time outdoors. And we even began this in the middle of winter because as the Scandinavian saying goes, there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes. But you don't have to wait for a doctor's order to increase your time outdoors. I took my own advice to heart and sold my elliptical workout machine that was sitting in the dark, uninspiring basement collecting dust. By choosing the alternative of putting on four layers of clothing to embrace the cold winter weather for walks outside, this has become an important part of my routine that truly creates more joy. Another doctor who has been influential in spreading that important message of the human to nature connection is Dr. Ching Li from Nippon Medical School in Tokyo. He has inspired many, including us, about the Japanese practice of Shinrin Yoku, which translates in English to forest bathing. Shinrin Yoku is being practiced beyond our efforts to incorporate into office wellness programs, neighborhood initiatives. Uh, neighborhood planning initiatives for the purpose to provide the health benefits that exist with a human to nature connection. So in closing, we would like to leave you with two main messages. The first message relates back to our brief but impactful time in the boundary waters. And that is, don't wait for the once a year vacation to experience the benefits of nature. Take breaks outside every day, even if it's just for 10 to 15 minutes. But also teach younger generations about the importance of nature and preserving our world. And consider bringing nature inside your homes, schools, and work settings, since we spend most of our time there. And our second main message is to collaborate. For people in all fields to value nature, but also consider it as an important part of the palette 
that we use to improve society. For example, engineers can work with developers and ensure nature is a critical part of an urban development project. Architects can use nature as another building material. People in IT can create apps that inspire individuals to get outside. And business leaders, they could bring plants inside, provide that as another employee benefit, just like providing free coffee. If you haven't suspected it already, we have been married for five years, and visiting the Boundary Waters as newlyweds was just the beginning of our journey. Now we have been able to form the ultimate collaboration in our personal and professional lives. By combining our two disciplines, we have found ways to partner in our work with a common goal and passion for promoting wellness through nature. And we hope all of you are inspired to connect with nature, but just as importantly, to collaborate and consider nature as an important part of this toolkit that we use to improve our world. Thank you. <laughs>